Hello listeners and welcome to the show. This is Sam Abrika, the CEO of Nova Money, an AI financial planner designed to help you build financial freedom. In this episode, we will talk about developing the right financial habits, why it's so hard and why it's so important. We will hear the story of Atto, consultant at KPMG, whose good habits allowed him to become an investor and homeowner. But Otto wasn't that financially savvy when he was 18, and he learned it the hard way. Hello Otto, and welcome to the show. Today we're going to talk about habits. Hey, hey, thanks for having me, Sam. Really looking forward to talking about my money habits and how I can help your audience with that as well. My pleasure. I think habits is such an important topic that is quite often overlooked. So what made you realize that habits is something so important in life? I think for me, it was the spending habit. I think I didn't realize that I had a bad spending habit until one day I decided to check my bank statement at the end of the month because I had overspent. And then I started adding it up and I realized, wow, you spend a lot of money on things that you don't need to just because you're just used to doing that. And that's what made me realize I need to, you know, take this into account. I'm just sort of going on autopilot and this is affecting me in a negative way. So that was the first time I actually realized that I needed to make some changes. What was the trigger? Why did you have one month where you decided to check your bank statement? Okay, the real truth is, was that my overdraft rate was running out. <laughs> and then I got told that basically you're going to start getting charged for um, living in your overdraft. And I was like, these costs are going to be crazy. It was something like, I think, one pound per month, one pound per day, sorry, if it's over like a thousand, anything above that, then they increase the rate, I think, to one pound fifty to two pounds. So I'd end up spending like, 30 to 60 pounds per month just to stay in my overdraft so at that point I got used to checking my my account from then before I I wouldn't do it I would just live in my overdraft you know whatever get my paycheck and then just continue that sort of habit every month you don't care until you need to pay for it yeah exactly and for me personally I think living in my overdraft was like an extension of living in my bank account. This is why I said my spending habit was so bad because I didn't see anything wrong with it. I was interest free, you know, I'll pay it off whenever. To be fair, I don't even think I had any real intentions of paying it off. I just, it was just something <laughs> I was money. used why to. Why paying yeah, it off? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just used to it. I was just used to living in it. It was just like the norm to me. So... When I got to that point, I was like, this is not normal. This isn't how you should be living. But I got so used to the fact that that was a normal way to, you know, manage your money that I got my warning and luckily I I reacted in time. Your exact story, I've heard it dozens and dozens of times. When I was talking to our users at Nova Money, who one day, just like you, they wake up and they say, damn, I have some overdraft and credit card debt. Maybe I need to change something about my lifestyle. Otherwise, I'll be broke my entire life. And what they told me is when they were student, they took the habit of being an overdraft because the banks were offering free overdraft for the entire yeah. student time. Mm-hmm. And they thought, oh, it's a blessing. Look at that. I have free money. I can party. I can do anything I want. Although I'm a student and broke in reality. But I don't even need to face this reality. I can just live the life I want. And it's not a coincidence that banks offer free offer draft to students, and it's also yeah. not charity. They do it for the exact reason that you just described. Mm-hmm. You thought it was fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. everybody thinks yeah. it's fine. Look, free money. Let's party. Yeah, and it's just encouraging debt. And I think for me personally, I wasn't educated in a financial sense. I wasn't educated. So even when I got into the agreement of having... What did you study? Um, I, I studied law as my first degree. So You're a lawyer. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well I'm not a not lawyer but by, by trade, but I wanted by education. to be a lawyer back then. Yeah, but by education, yes, I was a lawyer. But even studying law financially, it's not something you 
think of or are taught or something that even comes up. I mean, getting an overdraft was just the norm back then. Spending masses of amounts of money was the norm. Living in your overdraft was the norm. You know, we didn't think there was any big implications um, to, to living in your overdraft. For me personally, the biggest implications, and this is how you know I didn't really learn my lesson. I actually had two different overdrafts. I had an overdraft when I was actually doing my first degree. And in that situation, I, it was about 500 pounds, spent it up. I would pay it off a little bit here and there, but then I didn't keep the account active and I didn't read the terms and conditions. The terms and conditions no way. stated, <laughs> no, I mean. I always uh, wanted to ask this question. <laughs> 20, who's going to read? people who studied low. Do you read the footprints? Because if you mm. don't, then <laughs> I'm really wondering who is reading these footprints. So the the interesting thing is, as a lawyer, if it's as part of your job, yes, you would normally read the terms and conditions. But I was a first year student. I'm not going to read the terms and conditions <laughs> of a of you know a bank account. Like really, I mean, now I do for my credit cards. I, I look through the statements, look what the charges are like, and that's due to financial education, not because of legal <laughs> you know but um yes yeah, so i did i never read the terms and conditions and the terms and conditions stated that i needed to keep the account active i needed to be paying my student loan into that i didn't i didn't keep it active so the bank in question took it upon themselves to close my account notify me that they were closing my account and then they also said that i was in default because i had Oof. that overdraft on there so I had a black mark on my credit score saying I had defaulted with this bank and that I owed them however much it was, just below £500. So it made me feel like I was, um, at the time, even though I was in debt, I really felt like I was in debt in that situation because it made me feel like, oh, wow, are they trying to say that I can't afford to pay this or I'm irresponsible? And that's how I felt. But I clearly didn't really learn my lesson at that point because then I got another overdraft <laughs> in my <laughs> postgraduate. But I was a little bit more diligent. You know, again, I wasn't going out of my way, but I, was, I kept a little bit of an eye on that. But you could see that my habits still hadn't changed that much because I was living in my overdraft for the second situation. So it's, it's very important to understand what your habits are. You studied low, mm -hmm. undergraduate, postgraduate. You're obviously somebody very well educated, mm -hmm. articulated. Mm -hmm. And still, you <laughs> fell into this trap that millions of students mm -hmm. who are also educated fall into. Yeah. What do you think about this system of all banks giving free of the raft of students? And obviously, mm -hmm. although you had debt and probably a part of you rationed in you, oh, I have some debt, it didn't sound like you thought it was a problem. Yeah, like... I think the attitude to an overdraft when you're a student and you're not making much money is free money. That's your attitude, it's mm. free money. And you're already sort of hypnotized in a way because you're getting a student loan, you know, not everybody, but most people get mm -hmm. a student loan for your accommodation. You? Yeah, I got student loan, yeah. For your accommodation and it's getting paid for your course. You're already sort of in that mindset that, oh, at some point, I'm going to pay it back. So you're on a debt mindset without realizing how significant the debt is because you're living in a bubble. Effectively, as a, mm. as a university student, you're living in a bubble. You don't really understand any of the implications because you're not living in the real world. Yeah, you have to pay bills and stuff like that, but it's nothing massive. And you sort of have that bailout well, in a just way. Just take more debt. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So you're getting into this debt life cycle without understanding that it's not good for you. So... For me personally, I think the bank offering overdrafts is not great because people don't have the financial education to back it up. If people had the financial education to back it up, then they, there's no problem. They understand, okay, I'm borrowing money. I'm going to pay it back. This is how I'm going to pay it back. I'm not going to incur that many charges. But the fact is, when people are taking out these overdrafts, they don't have the financial education. They don't understand what they're doing. So they'll borrow money, not pay it off. And then they'll go and borrow money from somewhere else to pay off that first one. And it's just a continuous cycle forever. So I think in the current state of affairs, I would say it's not a great thing without the education. It's fascinating for me to hear that the bubble in which students live, because they get money from a loan mm -hmm. that 
they don't yet understand the implication and how much they will need to repay that mm -hmm. and how quickly and what are the interest rate. Mm -hmm. They want more money than free of a draft. Yeah. You have saturated your first overdraft, open another bank account, another overdraft. Whereas when I was a student, I was so broke that no <laughs> bank would lend me any cent, like 0.00. .00. I had to live the hard way. Yeah. And I had to be reminded every single day that, dude, you're broke. You have nothing. <laughs> Eat your pasta and shut the fuck up. And that was my life basically for five years. Wow. I was earning 300 euros in Paris. Wow. I just couldn't have any debt. That Banks, is amazing. I was not eligible. I was below the eligibility level of debt. So I had all my friends who were in business course and they were partying and having fun and enjoying <laughs> life and going on the weekend. I was just working. <laughs> wow. Wow. I mean, you were lucky. You clearly were lucky that... I guess you could say you were fortunate that they... Now, yeah, you. but yeah. not at the time. Yeah, you must have been feeling bad about that. Not at the time. Everybody had their weekend to enjoy life. I was just working, working, working. <laughs> past the body exams. But at least now I realize it made me understand the value of money. And I never had the habit of spending money that I don't have. Yeah. Because it was never even an option for me. I really wonder how I would have become if I had this luxury of, oh, free of a draft, free money free student loan well free it's never free it's, it's never delayed free. Exactly. payment that free is just an illusion yeah i completely completely agree it's funny that you say that because for every situation for every one of your situation there's probably 20 to 50 people who swing the other way where they've getting offered absolutely everything they're getting credit cards they're getting loans they're getting overdraft they're getting finance and you know all of those sort of things and it's really interesting because from my situation again it was just the norm for us to have an overdraft you know like one of my really really good friends i remember being at the cash point with him and I think he, he was a like minus 2,000 or minus 3,000. And he was just withdrawing <laughs> 20 pounds. Like nothing was happening. Like that was just, that was just the norm for him. And we, he withdrew that money to go out and, and drink. And I would be the same. That's what I would do as well. So it's just hilarious now thinking back to it. That was how we lived. That's how it was normal. You wouldn't get scoffed at doing, you'd probably get celebrated for doing that. You know, oh yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So it's, it's really interesting that you, your situation was so different and that you sort of were forced to see the light in some ways. And I think definitely be grateful for that because it could have been completely different for you. I'm grateful to all those who rejected me and gave me <laughs> nothing when I needed money the most. <laughs> it taught me the hardship of life yeah. and the value of money and time. Agreed, agreed. And that's the thing, like, Money is such a, sometimes it can be such a taboo topic in certain situations. I mean, people like to talk about, oh, this person made this much, how much. But when it comes to like debt and stuff like that, back then, people didn't really care. It was everybody. But now when you're out of uni and you're working, nobody wants to talk about debt anymore. It's, it's like you're sort of looked down upon a little bit. Uh, so it's very interesting how that dynamics change from, you know, university to post-university. Yeah, have you seen a shift in the man mindset? Yeah, yeah, people shy away from debt now. When you move to, let's say, post-university, you start off your career, it's not something that people want to talk about. Everybody wants to give off the facade that they're doing fine, they're doing well, they're making lots of money. It's a complete shift because being broke at university, having an overdraft, having a debt, that was fine because... Most of you were, so that was okay. Oh, yeah, that's cool. You know, you're eating noodles for a week. Okay, that's game. fine. That's, you know, <laughs> nobody's going to look down on you. But now, if that's what you're doing, people will be like, what's going on here? So, yeah, it's very, very interesting. I think the most dangerous part is it's at 18 that we start to shape our habits mm -hmm. of spending money, understanding our cash flows. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was 18, mm -hmm. first year at university, not living with my parents anymore. Mm -hmm. So I become responsible of paying the rent, of paying my transport, of paying my tuition fees, eating. I had to understand all my cash flows yeah. 
very well and very precisely when I would get my scholarship, when I would get paid, what date is the rent? Because if it's not there at the time it's debited, I'm going to be blacklisted from the student accommodation. Okay. And it's not a fun process. You may have one time a check rejected, but the second time you're going to be in a blacklist next year, you're not going to have the cheap student accommodation. Yeah. And this forced me to really understand my cash flows, money in, money out, how much I can spend. I would know almost by the euro, euro precision, how much I had and how much I could afford for anything. Because I know the outcome, it was not drawing an overdraft with free money. <laughs> it was being bloody kicked out. <laughs> but I imagine if you start your life and you shape your habits the first time you're doing something, mm -hmm. and if you start your life living on your own and you don't feel the constraint of managing your cash flows and understanding what's the money in, what's the money mm -hmm. out, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Because there's this free line of, of a yeah. draft, then it's so easy to take the habits of living beyond your means because there is no repercussion. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like you said, if you don't understand what your incomings are, I mean, everybody mostly understands how much money they're getting, but you don't understand how much is coming out of that. Can you actually afford to, to be wherever you are, where you're living, the food you're buying, you know, how much you're spending on entertainment and stuff like that. If you don't understand the difference between that and your outgoings and what's even left over for yourself to get you onto the next month, then yeah, you're going to be in real trouble. You could be in a situation, like you were saying, where you're going to get yourself kicked out in more dire situations. You know, that was for you as a student accommodation. So they might be a bit lenient. They might give you a few months. But in the real world, they might not give you that. They might just be like, you're, you're going to get evicted, you know? Or if you've got a mortgage, your house might get repossessed. So it's very, very, very important that people do understand that. But a lot of people don't seem to care or even understand it. So yeah, it's definitely a big issue out there. When did you start to realize the criticality of understanding your cash flows and how quickly <laughs> you need to repay this overdraft? For me, it was between 25 and 26 was when I started taking it very, very seriously. I think at that point, what hit me was Okay, I've got a credit card to pay off before the 0% rate finishes. I've got overdraft. To... Oh, did you also have 0% yeah, credit card? Yeah, I had a 0% yes? credit card. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. That's... So I had that. UK is such a wonderful country. <laughs> <laughs> but I heard we're Everything still better than the here. US, to be fair. I heard the US is, is credit card crazy. That's what I heard compared to us. So, mm -hmm. you know. It is. I have the data if you Yeah, want. yeah. I think actually you might have shared some data. See, I'm probably going to do something, a, a post on that. That's, that's going to be very interesting. But for me, personally, I had those things to pay off, like my credit card. I had my, um, my overdraft. And what I did, I actually sat down. I was like, okay, this is how much I need to pay off, right? How much can I afford to pay off my rent? I pay off all my bills all my entertainment, maybe I need to scale back on my entertainment a little bit. How much will I have to pay off for each of these each month? And then I would allocate a certain amount to each debt basically effectively. And then I'll then calculate, okay, so I've got four months time frame. Can I afford to pay off? I don't know, pay like 300 pounds a month because in four months I'd clear this. And that was literally my process and I managed to do it. And I actually did a video on YouTube talking about how, how I did it. it was, I mean, it was tough. I obviously had to scale back on certain things. There's certain things you can't scale back on. I couldn't scale back on rent. I couldn't scale back on my bills. Too late. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I could scale back on <laughs> drinking out at night, you know, maybe going out too much. I could scale back on that. Or maybe certain places are going on, you know, maybe not shopping in certain places as well. There was a lot of ways that I could scale back on. And that's when I took the opportunity to um to do that and that really really did help me out how did that feel the the moment that you realized oh i need to scale back my lifestyle now i need to <laughs> to come back to reality i mean at first it's a bit of a shock right you don't want to change 
the way things are you like enjoying yourself i mean i like enjoying myself i like spending i like when this happened this happened in summer which is even harder you know you want to go out for drinks (laughs) you want to go out to the park you want to do all of these sort of entertainments so at first it was difficult you know having to say no to people or suggesting oh can we do something different it was definitely difficult i would say at first but when I started to see, like, you know, my debt was getting paid off, I mean, that euphoria was good, to be honest. I was just like, wow, this is going mm. down. This is, you feel good. You feel like, yes, I'm getting somewhere with this. I feel like I can do this. I feel like I'm going to, you know, manage to get rid of all of this debt in time. So although it was hard, it was definitely worth it. I mean, I look back on it and I still think it was one of the best things that I've done. So, yeah, it, it felt great eventually. Did you have like a, a little fight in your head, like the, the evil voice? <laughs> no, Hato, keep enjoying life, screw the debt. And then the reasonable voice, hey, Hato, <laughs> pay the debt, be a reasonable person. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely tough for me, but I think what helped me stay focused was definitely the situations that I had been in prior. So, you know, having the uh, default on my my credit score i think that was definitely in the back of my mind like okay you want to potentially get a property in the future you want to potentially do all these things in the future so for you to do that you know you need to do this you you can't just rest on your laurels and i think having gone through that bad experience before prior is what got me to think okay you've been given a second chance you need to sort yourself out here And even then, even though I'm saying I've been given a second chance, I kind of put myself in that situation. So that was literally my second strike. So that literally woke me up like, okay, if you keep going on this way, you keep following this way, the future's not going to look good for you. So, you know, having those two situations is what kept me strong and what kept me going. So you said you put yourself in this situation. Mm -hmm. I would have a bit more sympathy Mm -hmm. because... Most people who are presented this credit card and this overdraft, when they're 18 years old, they're not particularly financially educated Mm -hmm. because it's not something that we learn at school. And I remember when I was 18, I just wanted to have fun in life. I didn't care about the implications, the footprints, and what happened if this, this, and that. So what were the implications of your first default? For me, oh man. (laughs) So... (laughs) Was it bad? It was. <laughs> bad, bad? It was. It wasn't like bad, bad, but there, there was like embarrassing moments. Okay, so this is what. Okay, this is this is gonna be an ironic story, right? So, with my default, get a, I wanted to get a tablet. You see, my spending habits are still. <laughs> they were still there, unfortunately. So I wanted to get a Sony tablet. There was one that I really, really liked because I used to work at a phone store. It was this really thin tablet. I was like, oh, I want a tablet. My laptop was old at the time. So I was like, yeah, tablet would be great. And I couldn't afford to get the tablet outright. So I was going to see if I could get it on credit from the Sony store. Right. So <laughs> as a student, right? Yeah. Yeah. This, yeah. Yeah. I was still a student at this time. And I went to the Sony store, tried to get it out on credit and yeah, my credit check failed. So that was embarrassing. <laughs> That was, that was embarrassing. So that was the implication for me. So when that happened, I started looking at my credit score a bit more seriously as well. Before that, I didn't really take it seriously because there was no real reason. Maybe it was for your own good. Yeah, it was. All of this stuff happened for my own good. You know, that's why I, I say to people, I've been through the ringer. That's why I'm like what I am now, which is why I'm so passionate about financial education and teaching people about this because... I've been through this and I don't want other people to mm-hmm. to go through this. And some people don't even know that they're going through it or they have the lack of knowledge. So that's why I push it out so much because it's like, don't know what you're going through. You don't know what your mindset's like. You need to change your mindset or, or otherwise 10, 15 years is going to go by and you're going to be looking back like, how did I get here? What happened? You know, you're going to have the wall pulled over your eyes and you're going to be like, how did this happen? And it's all due to because the education is not there and you, unfortunately, you might have been unlucky enough to to not come across it. So, yeah. And that's how you start a YouTube channel about financial education. Yes, 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 yes. Because for me, it was like a complete transformation. I was like, oh, wow, like, 
you've gone from a person who <laughs> who left uni with a, with a default black mark, and you know that bank, <laughs> right? That bank, I'm not allowed to get any other products with them. Can you believe that? You'd think that I hurt somebody over there, but I'm literally blacklisted. You think I did some sort of fraud or I did something big, I robbed the bank or... All I literally had was a five hundred pound overdraft. <laughs> I can't get a mortgage. For what five hundred pounds? Yeah, five hundred pound mortgage, which is nothing to you now, no, right? No, <laughs> I mean like five hundred pounds, and you. I can never get a mortgage from them. I can never get um, any products. I can't get any. I can't even get a simple account with them. I literally spoke with them about five wow. years ago, and they said that to me. I was like, seriously. Because for, to them, They're they don't care forgiving. about the situation. They just care that I defaulted in whatever, mm. you know, situation it was. So for me, it's because of that transformation of going from having that default to literally getting to a position where I bought my own property, uh, have investments, crypto stock. Showing that whole transition, I was like, I can't keep this to myself. I need other people are probably have gone through or are going through what I did in the past. So... Why don't I help them out as well? You know, give them a bit of a head start that I didn't get. When I had to search for the information, I was like, what is this? What is going on? I had to really, it took me years, honestly, years. Yeah, financial education is not something that people spontaneously look mm-hmm. for, or although it would be totally in their benefit to learn about mm-hmm. it. But at the time, I remember, so I grew up as a kid who had no money, and I wanted so many stuff. I was seeing all my friends. They had cool toys. They had Game Boy, yeah. PlayStation, <laughs> nice toys. I had none of that. Zero. I couldn't understand even why I couldn't have that because I was too young and too stupid. And I spent my life desiring stuff. I need this. I need that to be happy. Otherwise, my life is never going to be fulfilled. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of your story when the young Atto mm-hmm. needed absolutely this tablet. Mm-hmm. It's <laughs> yeah. death on life matter yeah no choice you absolutely need that how did it feel when you had to say to yourself no you can't get it i think fear of missing out is everyone gets it everybody gets it it's a crazy contagious disease (laughs) let me call it that (laughs) i think these days the fear of missing out i think i'm seasoned with it now but for your first time, because now you're much more mature yeah. in your 30s. It, you, you went through all of mm-hmm. that. But how was the first time, like the young actor mm. who desperately wanted this bloody tablet? It was tough. Honestly, it was tough. I mean, for me, I was gutted. Honestly, I was gutted. You know, I didn't see it as, oh, that was, it was good that it failed. I was gutted. I was like, I really, really, really wanted that tablet. And, you know... I think even months later, still it was still there. So yeah, no, it was it was definitely a situation where I just felt like I was missing out on something that I really, really wanted. It was hard for me to, you know, not get into that situation. I mean, if I honestly, I probably would have gone for another credit check if I if not for <laughs> if not for, you know. Um but yeah, no, it was it was definitely difficult for me to stomach it. So you didn't let that go. You were really obsessed about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's one of those things when you really want, for me anyway, I really wanted it because first of all, I never had had a tablet at that point. My laptop was really old and everybody seemed to have tablets. So I was like, it'd be cool to, to have one. Why not? So yeah, I definitely didn't want to let it go. Everybody's enjoying their life. Why not? Exactly. Me? Exactly. That was definitely 100% the feeling, which is what compelled me to actually even go there to try and get like a four or 500 pound tablet that I didn't really need, to be honest. So obviously, fast forward 10 years, you're still alive, mm-hmm. you survived, you're successful, you're building your financial freedom. So you can say to yourself, actually, I didn't need it. <laughs> but how long did it take you to realize that you don't need the stuff that you're absolutely convinced that you need to buy to progress in life? I think I started to realize that, I would say, definitely a few months later, I used to want the latest trainers, the latest clothes. And then I got to a certain point where when I was sort of budgeting, like with my overdraft and where I couldn't spend as much, I didn't realize I'm not missing out on anything. Number one. Two, there's always going to be something new eventually. So when I do have the money, I can just get that. 
you don't even realize that at the time like you're so worried about getting the now that something new's got to come anyway so what happens then are you going to just keep buying so those are the two things that just got me to like you know what I don't need to buy this stuff. I can only, I should buy this when it's really comfortable for me. When I'm like, okay, I can afford to do it. And I just realized I'm not missing out on getting any of these consumer items. So that, for me, it was, a, it was definitely a few months to years later for me to have that realization. I came from the opposite angle. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't afford anything in life mm-hmm. except eating rice and pasta. Mm-hmm. But what I was doing, I was building my wish list of all the stuff that I would buy the day I will have money. Yeah. And my list was long. Oh, hell, it was very <laughs> long. What I realized is the day I had money, I actually didn't want those things anymore. <laughs> is that what happened? Why did that, that happen? You desire what you cannot mm-hmm. have. That's true. That is very true. So I guess what happened is because you were used to living within your means, when it got to a point where you could afford it, it wasn't really sort of a want or exactly. need for you anymore because it wasn't a want or need for you when you couldn't afford it so it, that's what it became anyway so that is very very interesting in my first internship i said to everybody mm-hmm. i'm going to drive a mustang car because <laughs> they're so cool and i love the ford mustang and i love the noise and i just love everything about it of course i couldn't afford so it's, it's free for me to say yeah i'm going to mm-hmm. do this and that and i was convinced in my mind like whenever i was seeing a mustang in paris i would take a photo wow. <laughs> with me next to the mustang wow and then one day i had my driving license and i could afford did i buy it no wow i was just dreaming of having a mustang because i couldn't yeah. have it and it was for me a way to see oh i can get the stuff i want in life and i'm successful yeah, it's very, it's very but interesting. But the day I have the money to have the Mustang, do I want that? Yeah. No, I prefer traveling. I prefer investing. I prefer doing anything else. It's very, very, very interesting, that concept, because you're right. <laughs> and I think what also happens sometimes as well, for me, when I get the money, I'm like, would I rather spend it on trainers or investing? Most of the times it's investing that's what happens i'm like i'd rather put this money towards my investments let those grow or do something else with it then you know buy these items that the novelty just wears off after a few weeks honestly that's what happens it just mm-hmm. wears off you know like you get used to you teach yourself you know the novelty is going to run out right you're going to get this yeah you feel good one two weeks then it's gone then you're just going to be stuck with that item so yeah it's very 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 interesting I speak to a lot of people, they're the users of Never Money and they want to take control of their finances. Mm-hmm. A lot of them have stories very similar to mm-hmm. yours, unfortunately not with such small amounts, so they have accumulated a lot of yeah. debt. And it's a big slap in the face that they realize that actually it has consequences to accumulate yeah. debt. It reaches the point where even if you try to repay the nominal amount of what you have borrowed, mm-hmm then the interest rate is killing you and you can't repay this debt anymore. But your case, it sounded like it was a blessing that you got slapped in the face way earlier. And apparently, did it shift your mindset between this is what I want and I need it absolutely now in my life, no matter what the condition, into this is what I earn. What can I do with my money? Yeah, it was definitely very important for me because I guess I was in a situation where I was definitely living beyond my means, which is why I was in a situation where I had to pay off an overdraft, I had to pay off, you know, credit card, and I wanted to pay those off before interest rates started to hit me because I was like, yeah, I don't want to get into that sort of a hole. So I definitely, definitely decided after I paid that, that I would start to live within my means. That that was the point of everything that I needed to do. And for me, budgeting really, really helped that. It really helped me understand, okay, these are your incomings. These are all your outgoings. This is how much you want to save. This is how much you want to have as your spending money. All of those things tied together will help keep me, you know, on the straight and narrow. So I had definitely had to have a mentality shift. If I continued the way I was before, there was no way I would have been able to save up to buy a property or save up to 
get investments or anything like that. I would have just been in that situation, just continuing prodding along. So I definitely had to to change my mindset. I see a lot of young people, they now forget that they need to understand mm-hmm. their cash flows. Yeah. And cash flows, what is in very simple term? Mm-hmm. Money in, money yeah. out. And money in minus money mm-hmm. out is money saved. Yeah. The problem is in this day and age when we live in the social media era, yeah. a reality sounds depressing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's depressing because everybody is having so much more glamorous yeah. life on Instagram. They have so much fun. They have this and they buy that, etc. And it kind of looks like from the outside that everybody is having a better life than us and we are the only one miserable. So why even bothering with budgeting? And now I'm so happy that there is a new expression coming up. It's called Instagram versus reality. (laughs) And now smart people, they all know that Instagram is not reality, Mm -hmm. it's fake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, when you're just 18 and you want to enjoy life, it's not obvious that all what you see is fake. Yeah, it's a it's a really, really tough one because Instagram markets a lot of products. You have people influencing people to buy products and you have a lot of people at that influencing people to, to buy products. Instagram definitely creates one of the biggest FOMOs that's out there. When you have somebody portraying a lifestyle that they don't live, a lot of people want to aspire to that lifestyle. You know, like, oh yeah, I'm sitting on the beach with my laptop, I don't do a nine to five, I'm working two hours a week or whatever, I'm making X amount of money. Or I look really good in these trainers with this nice car behind me. It really makes people feel a little bit left out and that if they they acquire these items, that's where they're going to be. They're going to be cool, they're going to be hip. And I just think that it's a lot harder, especially with Instagram, when you're seeing people with lots of likes and, you know, things like that. It makes it a lot harder in the younger generation, because like you said, it's hard for them to understand that when you're taking an Instagram photo, you're doing a video, you're setting everything up. You just don't take a picture and you record stuff and that's it. No, these are professionals. So when you see those quality photos, that's all being set up perfectly. Things are getting positioned. Maybe those things are rented. Maybe the clothes are rented. Maybe the shoes are rented or they've been um, donated to that influencer to basically advertise to people. So a lot of people don't understand. Hours of setup. Exactly. Hours of preparation. Lots of, lots of Hours of makeup. Yeah, definitely. And I, even myself, I only realized that when I started doing my own YouTube, like it takes me hours <laughs> and, and I don't do no makeup or anything fancy like that. But even that takes me a while, you know, it takes a lot of thought because at the end of the day, you know, when you're putting quality content out there, you have to put some time and thought into it. So it's literally just advertising. And <laughs> a lot of young people don't realize that they're being advertised to. It's no different to watching TV ads, literally. is pretty much the same thing. Except that it's not obvious. Yes. Because Instagram started as a very simple photo sharing social mm-hmm. media. People were posting the holidays. So it started as something real. But as it grew and as it got acquired by Facebook for $1 billion, mm-hmm. Do you think Facebook would pay $1 billion just to see nice photos on the beach? No, no, no. Definitely not. They have a business Mm -hmm. plan. And their business plan is to transform everyday people into influencers. Mm -hmm. And then they will leverage their image and how good they make you feel Mm -hmm. to sell products. So that you believe that what is making them feel good Mm -hmm. and happy is the product they're posting. But the thing that you don't see, and I've started also my YouTube channel and looking at Instagram, the thing that you don't see is this is not reality. They actually have a lot of preparation to give you that feeling. And what you don't see is they might come across as everyday people, but a lot of them, they are advertisers. This is their Mm full-time job. They actually make 
10 times more money than what you would get in a normal corporate life. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's quite crazy because, as you said, there's a lot of work that goes into them advertising to people. And like you said, I think with Facebook buying Instagram, it was seamless, wasn't it? Like you said, it started with like just photo sharing, you know, and they started mm -hmm. adding as people can start promoting products. Because that's not what it was built on. It wasn't built on that premise. If it was built on that premise, maybe people would be a bit more skeptical. But because it wasn't built like that, and it's not so obvious to people, and people just slip it in. It's not like on their photo, ad, 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 ad everywhere. It's it's not like that. It's never written yeah, ad. It's natural. They they make it so natural that you don't even realize that. It's, and it's their job yeah. to make it sound so natural. Yes, exactly. That's the point. It's a job. It's not a hobby. It's a it job is. for a lot of Instagram. It is. It is a job. And would I say that's bad? I mean, consumerism is always going to exist, right? Marketing is always going to exist. Businesses need to make money. I get that. I think the only thing I would caution definitely is that Influencers are just honest. They're just honest and say, yeah, this is an ad. I'm promoting this. As long as they don't lie and portray something that they're really not. I mean, if they're sitting on a the beach, they're sitting on the beach. People can interpret that. But as long as they're not lying to say, yeah, I'm living this fake facade life to make people feel like, you know, that's what's happening. As long as they're not doing that and you they're know, honest. A lot of them are renting. Exactly. They're renting just for one day a luxury apartment mm -hmm. and they pretend this is their life sign. Exactly. And that's what I have issue with where you are faking a lifestyle because then you are making people feel not that it's not attainable because I think there's a lot of things that are attainable, but that that's what's normal for you. That's where you kind of skew people's sort of judgment and that's where you influence them about the, the wrong thing. So that's where I have the most issue with being dishonest. Advertising is fine because at the end of the day, advertisements is always going to be there. But it's when you're dishonest and you're trying to paint a picture that's false and you know it's false, the picture that you're painting and you're doing it deliberately. That's the issue that I have with it, really. And companies are not evil. It's their purpose yeah. to make yeah. money by selling product or mm -hmm. services. And I like companies. I'm myself an entrepreneur. I build never money yeah. because... I want people to build their financial freedom and I want to make money the right yeah. way by helping people. Mm -hmm. But I think that most of the companies put so much money into the social media platforms mm -hmm. and they hire not only the advertisers, but they hire the engineers mm -hmm. and they do the machine learning so that they combine all the expertise of the advertisers and the engineers mm -hmm. and they use all our data to know even better than ourselves yeah. what we yeah. want. And that's why in, at the end of the day, it becomes so hard to resist because it's so compelling. Hey, look at this fancy lifestyle. <laughs> Get it now. Why being so grumpy and unhappy in your life? Reach that next level of enjoyment. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you don't have the money, we all know what's the solution. Yeah. Here's a credit card. Exactly. Look, your first thousand pounds is absolutely free. Get into the habit yeah. of enjoying a bit more your yeah. life. <laughs> we'll make money from you a bit later. No, they don't say that last part. <laughs> but I think what is missing is to counterbalance yeah. all this temptation with the financial education. Yeah. That's why I like your Instagram yeah. channel and your YouTube channel, because you're teaching people about what they can do with money. Look, it's not just to pursue mm -hmm. this item. And maybe, yes, you may buy one, two, three, but don't believe that your entire life, the, your sole purpose is to buy stuff. That's not going to make you happy. Exactly. And here are all the things also you can do with money that will give you confidence, freedom, that will make you less stressed about your, your daily yeah. life. I completely agree. I agree with all the points that you've said. Financial education part is really important. And I think, you know, you touched on something nicely. Instagram is true. There needs to be a counterbalance. Sometimes you need a break from all the consumerism that you're seeing, all the influence in that you're that you're seeing and you need something else just to remind you are you sure you really want to you know buy these boots that you've just seen from this influencer maybe think about it can you afford it what about next month what about two months now would you still really want it there 
then and I feel like that education and just making people very very aware of this is even more important because a lot of people are not aware of it they just they don't understand that this is a thing because they haven't got the education obviously money is there to be spent that's true it is you know ultimately you will spend money but there are other things you can do with your money like you said you can save it you can use it to free up your time in the future you can use it pass it on to your next generation so there's so many other things that you can do with money aside from spending and getting yourself into debt which a lot of people don't understand that there's other things that you can do with it so compounded interest rate is the eighth wonder of this world that's what they say yeah it's not for me it's from albert einstein yeah. he was a very smart yeah. guy very intelligent and he discovered mm -hmm. that the problem I find is when you spend your day in today's context, Instagram, social media, mm -hmm. etc., you kind of get the perception that the only thing you can do with money is to spend it. Yeah. And we kind of forget all the other possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can invest, you can save, mm -hmm. you can donate, you can have like maybe longer term projects that are not immediately advertised to you because they might require more mm -hmm. money. For example, a lot of people, their dream is to be homeowner, buy a house, mm -hmm. build a family. That obviously requires some money to get your initial deposit to understand the mortgages. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I like what you're doing on Instagram is you're showing very well and educating people, hey, this is what you can do by investing by saving and by the way it's not that complicated yeah. don't believe all those who try to make it so complicated yeah. and what we're trying to do at nova money is to force people thinking what do they really want from life because if they don't spend just one minute thinking what do i really want they will spend their days being influenced and manipulated by everything else that they see and they will forget themselves and they will spend their life just working and working to spend money on stuff that they didn't even want in the first place. And that's where understanding what you can do with yeah. money, understanding financial planning, how to set financial objectives, how to reach them, how your monthly budget will make you succeed in what you really want from life is absolutely critical. It's not as hard as people think. It's just about you know, setting some time aside and just be willing to, you know, consume the information. I mean, there's so many ways that you can consume it now. You know, when I started learning, I had to like, you know, the really complicated um, website, but now you've got Instagram. Which one? Or websites. I used to learn from a money saving expert. I still get his newsletters to be fair. That's why I started learning about just personal finance, just in general. And then for investing, I used to look at Fidelity and Morningstar as well. So that's where that's where I started with, with investing. But those websites, they're complicated. You know, the first time I read them, I did not understand what they were talking about, all the jargon. But what's good about this day and age is, is that like you have other platforms where people are talking about personal finance, investing, uh, property investing, all those things. And they're discussing it in a way that's a little bit more accessible and they uh, explain it in a better way. I mean, you've got your YouTube, you've got your Instagram, you've now got TikTok, you've got Clubhouse, even your podcasts, lots of podcasts that, that are now talking about the this. Never money Exactly, mindset. yeah, yeah. Please. Excellent place. Yes, excellent place. To invest in your financial education. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so... There's almost no excuse. It's, it's so accessible now. It's just about wanting to, to do that. There's so many people out here that are trying to help make it as easy as possible to understand it. And as long as the content's still out there, this area grows. And I feel like the financial education area is still going to grow in the future. In the next five to 10 years, I think it'll be a big, be a big thing because it's important. There's so many people that lack it when I say there's so many people that lack it, I mean, we we wouldn't be growing if there wasn't a problem. And there is, there's clearly a problem. So it's, it's definitely very important that you invest in your financial education and just search out. One of the hard parts is for people to know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's always the hardest part when you really come into a new discipline, a new era that is out of your comfort zone and people are just bombarding you with jargons, it just feels so daunting. Now you can understand how people feel like when they're reading legalese 
in the terms of condition. <laughs> yeah, honestly, the legal part is still boring to read. I get that. It is definitely boring to read. I mean, on a lot of information anyway, these days, a lot of sections have this part called key facts that you can look at if you don't want to read the terms and conditions. And that's quite good because it at least gives you the key facts that you need to be aware of. Um, you know, like maybe if you're getting a credit card, the interest rate, if there's any promotional offers or anything like that, you know, defaults and all that sort of stuff. So at least reading that will give you a decent understanding. And then from that point of view, you're going to feel like you're in more control because you understand. But if you don't have no understanding, you're just going to do whatever you want because there are no guidelines set for you. But if you have guidelines set for you, it's more than likely that you will stick to it and follow it. One of the hard parts of education is knowing what will be the benefit of mm -hmm. it. And it's very hard to know what's the benefit in investing into financial education mm -hmm. when you don't even know what you don't know. Yeah. So obviously for anyone who are a bit further into their financial journey, they understand their cash flows, mm -hmm. they have a safety net, they understand investment, mm -hmm. they understand how they can plan their life and how they can be in control of their money. Of course, for them, it's absolutely obvious and evident that financial education is critical. And my experience in life is the main difference between people who start their life at exactly the same starting point, but some of them will get richer and richer over life and some will get broke, is financial education. Because financial education will set your mindset. And that's why this podcast is called The Nova Money Mindset, because the money mindset is so important, exactly the way that you had this slap in your face when you were young and student. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you had to one day to sit down and say, okay, maybe now I need to change my habits. Mm -hmm. These habits will compound over time. How do you think your life would be now if you were still trying to live on credit and buy everything in the present, regardless of your financial situation? If I had continued down the path of, you know, living in my overdraft and uh, staying in debt with like my credit cards, I definitely would not have had enough money. Probably would have not had no savings. I would have had no deposit to buy a house. I wouldn't have any sort of investments. And the reason why those things are important is because I'm trying to work towards a place where I have financial freedom, where... I can spend more time on the things that I want to do rather than, you know, not that I've got anything against nine to fives. I think nine to fives are great. But, you know, as I get older, I want to focus on doing other things, maybe, you know, helping out courses and maybe writing my own book, maybe even educating. I would want to do that more than um, nine to five. But I feel like as a person, when you're subject to having to receive a paycheck and relying on just a single paycheck, it means you're, I wouldn't say a slave, but it just means that you don't own your time. That was very, very important for me personally. So I feel like if I didn't do that, I will just be living pay to, to paycheck, to be honest. And I would have been in a lot of debt, um, which probably would have affected me mentally as well. Because for me, I'm an ambitious person. So I probably would think to myself, I'm not getting anywhere. Maybe I might have got demotivated at work. My life is not where I want it to be. And then I probably ultimately wouldn't even get to do the things I wanted to do. Maybe I can't travel to certain places because I'm in so much debt. I'm at probably at a point where maybe I can't even borrow any more money. <laughs> Everything's maxed out. <laughs> Everybody's saying no. I told you you're not good with your money, so we can't give you any more money anymore. So I would, I would have probably been in a deep hole uh, in, if that were the case. I mean, now... I've had good life experiences. I've traveled to really nice places. You know, some of my favorite places, Mexico, I've done Singapore, um, I've done Indonesia, some really, really nice places. I've got my own place. So I just feel like it could have been a really bad situation. And then let's say if I lost my job and I have no savings, then I'm really, really in the hole because at that point I can't pay my rent and then I become homeless, you know, or maybe have to move back into my parents. So that's what faces some people when you don't get your act together. That's probably what would have happened to me if I didn't get my act together, to be honest. Very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. Atu, last question. What's your ideal of financial freedom? What's my ideal? Yeah, so my ideal is to have the current property that I'm in paid off. 
So it's just rent it out to a family or whoever wants to live here. And then have one other additional property, like maybe paying me a bit of a salary. And then my investments, I have enough in it that every year I can draw out a little bit to live on. That's that's my perfect scenario if I can. And I'm retire early. Yes, 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 retire early. So the, the point of all of that, sorry, I didn't even say. When I say retire early, it's not that I'm not gonna do no work. I am going to do work, but I now have the time to do that and to the exactly to focus on that. I don't need my nine to five to pay me. I'm paying myself. <laughs> I've gotten things that is paying me. Effectively, I am my own boss. I'm paying myself. When people say your own boss, I think a lot of people don't understand what it really means. The point is, is that you are self-sustaining so that whatever you decide you want to do, whether you want to stay at nine to five, you really like it. But you just want to stay there. You want to stay there. But you have, you've got your investments or whatever there just in case something happen in the future. Maybe you want to leave the company. Maybe the company goes bankrupt. Maybe they sack you, whatever, right? But you're okay. That's what it truly means by being your own boss, as people say, that you effectively own your own time. So, yeah. Awesome. And it all starts with having good money yeah. habits in life. Definitely. 100%. Atu, thank you so thank much you, thank you. for this conversation you, Sam. and have you a good thank day. You. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this episode enjoyable, inspiring and educational. In this era of instant gratification, it is more important than ever to train our delayed gratification muscle. So keep learning, keep improving by 1% every day. You may not see the results right now, but this is a secret of all the successful people I've met. Please help me spread financial education by sharing this podcast with your friends and community. I would love it if you could also leave us a review. It really helps the show. Now, I would like you to forget about all the advertising that is being pushed to us on a daily basis and think about your personal financial goals. What do you really want to achieve with your money? If you have financial objectives, then check out the Nova Money app. Nova is an AI that will show you how to set financial goals and how to achieve them. A plan is only useful if you can follow it. That's why Nova will send you daily motivational messages to give you the strength to ignore the daily temptations of spending money and stay focused on your goals. Like other budgeting apps, Nova connects all your bank accounts in one place to give you the full picture. The difference is that the Nova AI will do all the budgeting and tracking for you. The second difference is that unlike many free personal finance apps, we don't sell users data. All your data is encrypted and will remain completely private. Make sure that you're investing in your financial education. Make sure that you're building your financial freedom and I'll speak to you in the next episode.